Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. It's Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. Dennis Rimmer here and uh, welcoming back to our our podcast microphone from Toronto and sometimes in Florida. It's Joy Fielding. Hey, Joy, are you having a joyous time these days? (laughs) Well, I guess within reason, you know. (laughs) I'm I'm having a time anyway. It's occasionally (laughs) joyous. So I've got in front of me all the wrong places, and she's not there, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I understand there's something new just released a while back, Cul-de-Sac. So what's yes. what's that all about? Well, uh, Cul-de-Sac, actually, uh, it's been in the store now for a few months. It's... Um, it's a story of, uh, a, of a cul-de-sac, a small dead-end street in a uh, sort of horseshoe say, horseshoe-shaped street in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, uh, and it's about the five families who live on that uh, small cul-de-sac, and um, at the very beginning of the story, you learn that there has been a shooting, someone has been killed, you don't know who did it, and you don't know who the victim was, uh, and uh, then you go back three months and you you trace you you learn about these five families, and they're all you know quite different, but they all have their own problems, and uh, you know just kind of the notion that you never really know what goes on behind closed doors, and the the different the main difference here uh, is that. Basically, everyone in these five families has access to guns because, you know, Florida is a concealed carry, or it's called actually an open carry state, which means that it is legal uh, to carry a concealed weapon, very easy to get a license to do so. And um, so I, I wanted to really tell a story about, I wanted to address the gun culture in the U.S. and uh basically through the lives of five seemingly ordinary families. Well, like you said, it's like the Charlie Rich song, No One Knows What Goes On Behind Closed Doors. So it's a murder mystery, as it were, in a cul-de-sac. So I guess it's a dead-end street in more ways than one, huh? Well, that's right. It's, you know, the it, it is very much that. And uh, I, I'm not sure I would, I, I guess you could classify it as a murder mystery or they, you know, they promote it also as a thriller. I'm not sure that's really a, you know, I, I, I prefer to think of it really just as a, as, a, as a novel, really, you know, which deals with some pretty significant issues, but in a very entertaining way. And clearly there is this mystery of, who was killed and by whom. So, um, you know, I wouldn't waste a lot of time when you're reading it trying to figure it out. I'm, I never do. When I read a book, even even something that's really overtly a mystery, uh, I never try to figure out uh, who did it. And I'm always a little disappointed if I, if I do, because I'm not trying. So when <laughs> the answer becomes obvious to me, then I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, dear, I wish that weren't so, so I think in this case you get five very lo- you know these families. There, there is a logical victim and and um, what's the word for an aggressor? I guess uh, shooter uh, in each household. You know, it, it could be anyone. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think when when the answer is revealed, it's the one it should be. Was that the impetus, uh, like you said, sort of addressing the gun culture situation in Florida and the U.S. in general, or was there something yeah. else? Yeah. So that... Yeah, no, that was it. I mean, I, it was two things, really. I sort of toyed with the idea for a while about doing kind of the double mystery, not only a whodunit, but who who was it done to, because um, I thought that would be interesting, and, and certainly it's an interesting hook to grab the reader. Um but then I also did want to state, make a statement about about the pervasiveness of guns and, and in the U.S. and uh, and the danger of this 
you know, open carry this this notion that I mean it's like the Wild West, you know, you don't you go to a restaurant and half the patrons could be packing, you know, it's not a comforting thought. Well, we just saw that play out in uh, Wisconsin in the last oh, few weeks. Oh, disgusting. So, yeah, just disgusting. So, it's crazy. Uh, that's uh, Cul-de-Sac, the new one, but there's dozens of uh, Joy Fielding <laughs> books. <laughs> right I've everywhere. Dozens of them everywhere. So um, over the last couple of years, have you seen uh, your sales, like because of the pandemic and, and people stay, have sales increased or anything you know like what? that? I, I actually don't ever even follow that. I... Um, I maybe I don't want to know, or, or maybe like it doesn't really make any difference. It's like um, I I think my state my my sales have have uh, remained quite steady. I I would like them to increase. I don't know if they have. I know that I was just told that Cul de Sac went back for a third printing, which is really nice. Um, but uh, you know I I almost can't concern myself with with those things uh as long as they still want me and i'm still you know making good money and they're i'm signing contracts and my my sales you know are around the world so i'm going to assume everything is pretty healthy um but i don't i don't like to keep track like i don't i i it's too easy to kind of go down that rabbit hole and really start worrying about stuff and i have enough to worry about so um it's like I, I I never read my my letters from my stockbroker. I have no idea what my stocks are doing because I know it would make me absolutely crazy. So I just assume that things are going okay. <laughs> They'll let me know if they aren't. Um, back to the publishing industry. You've been uh, publishing for a while since the last, first time I talked to you was 1985, I think it was. Has the industry changed in 30, 40 years, uh, for the better, for the uh, worse? Oh, yes, it's changed a lot, because uh, not necessarily for the better, um, because when I first started uh, writing, there were like 30-odd publishing houses, and I mean major publishing houses, and now there are four. So um, they they have, you know, either combined, Bertelsmann has bought, you know, or, or Random House, you know, which is owned by Bertelsmann, ha, ha, you know, really controls the market. There's uh, So there's the Random House group, there's Simon & Schuster, there's HarperCollins, and uh, I'm not sure what the fourth is, but they're, you know, they're, what what that means is that, that really what gets published is in the hands of a very small number of people, and, um, and it really reduces, obviously, the writer's bargaining power the uh because you have only so many options now within these giant conglomerates there are you know different publishing houses but the fact is they are all under one you know random house controls the vast majority and i mean i happen to be with random house you know with double day in canada and with another division of random house ballantine in the u.s and with another division goldman in germany which is part of the bertelsmann groups and and so on and so on. So um, I luckily have individual contracts for all these countries, but I know that a lot of uh, a lot of the publishing house, a lot of the writers now are under worldwide contracts, which again really limits your your income. And um, it's so I I think the what's happening is not necessarily for the the readers' benefit. I mean, for the writers, for certainly for the authors' benefit. Because it's um, it also narrows the market, and that that these publishers are all looking for the next big thing and for you know a solid hit. And the book business doesn't really run the way other businesses run. Uh, you know, it it relies on word of mouth, which which means that the six week window you get in bookstores really isn't going to cut it. You know, because it'll. It might take months for the you know word to get out that hey you should read this book and then of course you can't find it anywhere. Well, you can't so, find it. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's very frustrating. All these things very frustrating for for the author. And um, aside from a few, you know, like the mega sellers and and that's uh, you know it's just hard. And also there used to be all these you know little bookstores, privately run bookstores, and now we have. 
uh, you know, Indigo. Uh, if Indigo ever goes under, we're in big trouble because there's no one else. And the same with, with in the U.S. where you had borders go under, where you have um, uh, basically Barnes & Noble, which has been in trouble for years. Uh, so it, it becomes a very iffy proposition and of course ultimately it's the writers who are going to pay the price. And I heard years ago even this talk about there was a lack of what they used to call a mid-list authors. Right, yeah. right. It's well, you know, I can't remember which publishing house it was that virtually let go all their mid mid-list writers. And the, the, the fact of the matter is that like something like 90% or more of writers make under well, I'm going to be generous and say $10,000 a year. Um, there are 5,000 books published every month, and so when you get 90% of those writers making less than $10,000 a year, you're, you're talking basically, you know, poverty level here. So most writers um, are in the unfortunate position of having to work a couple of other jobs in order to, you know, feed themselves. Uh, so it's, it, I mean, it's never been an easy thing to be a writer and and really i one of the things i always say is you know like nobody becomes a writer to make money if <laughs> if you it, you know if you do happen to make money then you're very lucky uh but you you become a writer because you love to write you have a need to write you um it's what you you want you know very much to do and you don't care whether you may i mean you would like to make money obviously and you would like it to be your only job but um you know, you don't, that's not why you become a writer. And uh, so people who, who think that they can just sit down and polish off a bestseller, you know, well, the odd one might be able to, just as, you know, the odd person might succeed at something they have relatively little talent at. But, you know, you you don't know. You can't, you can't count on it. I would say it's a very solitary life and, um, and one with no uh, guarantee of success no matter how smart or talented you are. So you have to really love what you're doing. I, you know, I, I say don't become a writer unless you really love to write. <laughs> exactly, and I've talked to lots of, uh, lately, of course, the, the self-publishing people who, you have to do it all from that standpoint. Like I've talked well, to a few people, you set up your own uh, accounting and marketing and publicity and well, collections. Well, that's it. I, and... I think... I, <laughs> I think if you're if you're if you're self-publishing, then you are really you become more of a marketer than you do a writer because you you write the book and then you're virtually spending 24 hours a day trying to find an audience. Um, occasionally, one will really hit it big. I mean, that was how Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, became a worldwide phenomenon. She started on the you know she self-published. And uh, it obviously touched a nerve. I couldn't get past page 100, but yeah, um, <laughs> I know what a you lot mean. of people <laughs> obviously did. And 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 then she got a publishing deal. So uh, it does happen, but it's like winning the lottery. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't get. But there was not enough juicy stuff in it for me. If you know what oh, I'm saying. Oh, it was so adolescent. God, <laughs> I just couldn't believe. People. You know, it was like really. <laughs> and I just thought if I read more than a hundred pages, I'm never going to want to have sex again. <laughs> it was it was just so infantile. <laughs> Joy Fielding is with us, of course, talking about writing and books. Her newest one, a cul-de-sac. But way back when, you apparently you were in Hollywood. You told us for a while. You actually kissed Elvis Presley. I didn't get the story last time we talked about. That. Oh my goodness! I've told this. I've eaten off this story for fifty years. Yay! Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, it was a long time ago, obviously. I was uh, very young and um, went to to hear him, to see him sing in Las Vegas one weekend. I was living in L.A. at the time trying to act and um, went with my sister who was visiting from Toronto and uh, my best friend in L.A. and we bought tickets to Elvis' show and went to Las Vegas for the weekend. And I'd never been to Vegas before or anything. And we found out, this is so silly, we found out, uh, we went to the hotel, we were staying at the same hotel as Elvis was staying at and performing in. And we just went up to the front desk and asked what floor Elvis was staying on. And believe it or not, they told us. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, we went up there uh, around midnight, I guess, 
uh, and we had tickets to the show the next night, and so we went up around midnight to the 27th floor, and uh, we got off the elevator, and there were a handful of other young women who obviously also had asked the same question, and we were all kind of stood around hoping Elvis would appear, and lo and behold, he did, <laughs> and... Uh, so he talked to us all for, you know, a few minutes, very polite, very gorgeous. It was in his drop-dead gorgeous period. And uh, we all just kind of stood around ooing and aahing and chatting. And then one of the girls yelled out, kiss me, Elvis, kiss me, kiss me. <laughs> so uh, he very obligingly uh, went around and just sort of, you know, kissed every all the girls on the cheek. And, <laughs> and I was sort of standing back, you know, being shy Canadian girl in, uh, you know, in a micro mini slit down in my navel. And, uh, you know, and I had this long waist length cascade of hair, you know, and um, I I just kind of hung back and he just kind of looked over at me and just cocked his little finger and beckoned me forward. And so uh, I, I went up expecting to be kissed on the cheek and instead he just wet me into his arms and gave me this phenomenal kiss, really, you know, on the lips, and as I said, tongue and all, so uh, it was quite the kiss, <laughs> so I was, I was, I was quite startled, actually, but it was, it was a lovely kiss, and then he kind of pulled back, and in his little drawl, he said, that was nice, <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. That was it, oh, thank uh, you. Thank you, ma'am. So Thank you very much. My, that was my guess. My <laughs> sister was yelling, give him my room key, give him my room key. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't. One of my regrets. Right. And back to acting after we get away from Elvis, if possible. Winter kept, kept us warm, you know. I saw that way back when, and I really yes. liked it. And I didn't know you were in that. I was. I was Bev. I was the, um, well, we called at the time she was the loose woman because oh, oh. she actually slept with her boyfriend. Oh, no. And, uh, you know, I mean, how times have changed. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I did. Oh, yes, I was, I mean, it's, I, I saw the movie a number of years back. There was a 25th anniversary of it. I mean, we're probably coming on to our 50th by now. And, um, and I saw that, and I was surprised. The movie really held up quite well. It, it's, I mean, it was shot for $8,000. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, we kind of improvised all our own scenes and everything, but it, it holds up. It, it's not bad at all. Although, I have to say that um, we didn't realize what it was about. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny when we when we watched it, the, the cast got together and we, we watched this movie, and, and I remember when it was over, because it was so clearly about a, a blossoming gay relay or an under under the the radar gay relationship that right. that we just didn't but it was so obvious that none of us realized it <laughs> and like i mean when the movie finished we all kind of looked at each other the two boys and the two girls myself and janet and and john and henry we were the four stars yep. and we we looked at each other and i remember saying I didn't know that's what it was about. Did you realize that's what it was about? We just all like went right over our heads. So um, it, you know, but it it was a it was a good little film actually. I I I think it stands up. And I just looked it up, and there you are, Joy Fielding as Bev, Janet Amos, Henry and John, Jack Messenger, uh, people Right, like I went to high school with Jack Messenger, yeah, I was in high school, well, certainly university, we, well, we were all together in university, but I think oh. I went to high school with Jack, too. That's... It was funny, it was quite a group, you know, I, yeah. I remember how I got involved was uh, David Sector, who wrote and produced, he, well, he wrote most like had the general idea and we kind of improvised our scenes but um he he approached me asking if i knew how to get in touch with janet with janet amos because he was going to do this movie and i said oh can i be in it <laughs> and that that's how i got in it oh that's great <laughs> joy fielding is with us uh, talking about all of her books lots of them the newest cul-de-sac uh, all the wrong places out there she's not there she's not there about the child that disappears while the parents are off doing something at a vacation resort was that kind of inspired by that uh, madeline case in in spain oh absolutely 
Uh, yeah, I I was um, you know I was thinking uh, such a you know it's really every parent's worst nightmare and and um, I was thinking just well would it, it would be sort of interesting if you if you approached it from you know I don't remember how like 15 years later or whatever how I can't remember how many years ago it's in the book but it's probably around 15 where you know where this child does disappear while the parents are having dinner uh, on an outdoor patio uh, you know just really underneath the window from their room and uh, the child disappears and I thought it would be interesting to tell the story from like when at the actual child's disappearance, what's going on then, and then 15 or whatever it is years later, when the mother uh, gets a call from somebody who says, "I I think I'm your daughter," right? And and so and then the story goes back and forth, you know, from past and present, and the and the trick there that was making each half, or because it goes back and forth, but each story as interesting as the the other one you know you couldn't have one story more compelling than the other one so luckily they these were both actually very easy uh incidents to make compelling enjoy fielding and we'll not wrap it up quite yet but before we do tell us about your website joyfielding.com i'm looking at it right now and you can enter a contest uh ebooks for out of print books you can follow joy there's a letter from joy every month so that must keep you busy too yeah the letter um well you know this is one of those other things i you know i have a woman uh who runs it for me so she does the contest whatever i write the letter every month uh, which is fine. I just made, they're very chatty. I just tell you what I've been up to, and you know, which for a large part of the pandemic was basically nothing. <laughs> and uh, you know, I did my job. I did write a book. Okay. I, I spent I spent a, I spent a year pretty much paralyzed. Like I I couldn't even read. I couldn't focus. I I just between going for long walks with my sister and exercising and and watching TV, that was literally all I did. And then suddenly I got an idea and I thought, okay, I've got nothing else to do, might as well write it. So because we weren't traveling or doing anything, I was able to just sit down and in about four and a half, five months, I, I wrote another book. So and that'll be out next summer. Oh, that'll be out next summer. Well, we'll have to yeah. look for that one. Yeah, I know what you mean. During that first while of the pandemic, I'm supposed to be writing a book, and I didn't. My attention no. span went down the toilet. I couldn't oh, read absolutely. for more than five minutes at a time. We'd watch something on Netflix or Crave or whatever just because it was mind-numbing and didn't want to do anything, didn't care if we did anything. We just kind of... That's right. That's around. right. It, <laughs> it was... Um, you know, I, I wrote a little piece about it for the Toronto Star, you know, how I was handling the pandemic because there, there was a, 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 a column where every week they were having a, a writer talk about how they were handling the pandemic. Of course, nobody approached me. I had to go to them and <laughs> say, hey, do you think you might be interested in what I have to say? And um, so I did. Um, and basically, I, I said that, you know, like everybody else that I've been reading about seemed to be handling it pretty well, but that I was kind of five seconds from fury at any given moment. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, really, I was like just not doing anything. I, I, I was suddenly, you know, from, from not... Uh, well, like when I met my husband, I think one of the first things I said to him was, I don't cook, I don't clean. And um, basically in the pandemic, that's all I was doing. So, you know, we didn't we didn't have our housekeeper because, you know, we couldn't. And um, so I was suddenly doing things I hadn't done in 40 years and, I, and things I don't like. <laughs> uh, like I hate cooking. I'm just, it makes me very anxious. I hate going into grocery stores. I don't like. I hate making the bed. I'm going to sound like a real prima donna here, but I don't like these things. And, um, you know, which was why as soon as I, I could get, you know, afford to have somebody else do them, I did that. And so um, suddenly I was having to, you know, for really a year and a half, that was me doing all these things. And so I would wake up every morning and the, and the first thing out of my mouth was a swear word. 
Yep. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, so I also I, I had no concentration. I couldn't read a book. Right. I could barely get through a People magazine. You know, when you know <laughs> that all you're doing is looking at the pictures, yep. you've really right. hit rock bottom. Right. <laughs> so um, that was kind of me for a year and a half, and then, or at least a year, and then finally, once I got this idea, I was able to sit down and because we weren't traveling, I could just work full speed ahead, and, and so I produced, you know, a book. And now, of course, I have nothing to do. <laughs> now, now, now I've finished a book, and I'm not ready to start another one, and there's nothing else to do. Okay. Well, we'll look for, <laughs> we'll look for the new one when it comes out, and maybe one after that as well. Uh, yeah, my wife decided to return to baking during the pandemic. Oh! Uh, that was good, and I decided to return to eating all the baking, so that was even better, so... <laughs> Well, you see, I lost six pounds during the pandemic because I think I had to suddenly start eating my own cooking. Oh. So this was oh. never a good idea. Oh, well, Joy Fielding, thank you very much. It's been a treat as usual. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at Amazon.ca. Oh, oh.